What is happening, everyone? Good morning, or I guess good afternoon by the time this episode drops. I'm Nick Nielsen with your boy Sam Lucchini here. We are very excited about this episode of Fireside Yankees as we get to talk about the potential future of the New York Yankees in Jason Dominguez, the Martian, the absolute stud prospect that's been climbing through the ranks in the Yankees minor league system. But before we dive into that, Sam, how are you doing today, my friend? You were just telling me about a long shift at work. But other than that, how you feeling? The batteries recharged? Oh, dude, I feel incredible. Um, I work at a bar on the weekend, so Friday and Saturday nights that you will you will see me at the bar bartending, serving the, you know, adult beverages for the uh, consumers of our generation. But no, I feel great. And it's, you know, it's really exciting to be able to talk about a guy like Jason Dominguez, just because we can talk about projections of what we're going to look at, you know, in the next two to three years, what an outfield trio of him or, you know, whoever it could be in the next couple of years. So I'm really excited to talk about this guy today because I honestly, like, Personally, I have not been able to talk about him a ton, so I'm excited to be here with you today, man. I'm pumped. Good to hear. Good to hear. This is what we love to hear. Now, Dominguez is, in my opinion, I, I, I've, got, I've been caught on record saying this, and I will still say this. I think Dominguez has the highest ceiling of all of our prospects. This kid is going to be a damn superstar whenever he gets his chance at the major league level. Last season was realistically now his first full season as a Yankees professional baseball player. Because as everyone remembers, the 2020 season was canceled for the minor leagues because of COVID. And then in 2021, 2022, he didn't really play a ton. I believe he got a couple of games under his belt, like probably 30, 40. But last year, we saw just how talented Jocelyn Dominguez is and why he got the nickname The Martian. I mean, you remember this, Sam. When the Yankees signed him in 2019, it was the most expensive international signing they have ever made as a franchise, coming in at a whopping $5.1 million for the, at the time, 16 year old stud so when whenever you have that kind of pedigree and backing you know the expectations are going to be high the one question i have for you is do you think that dominguez is able to kind of maneuver around all those expectations like you've heard people say he's going to be the next mick he's going to be the next mike trout but switch handed like do you think that does something more positive or negative for a kid of his age and stature um, I mean, it depends on really what you're talking about here. I mean, we've seen, you know, cases like that. You know, when, if you're talking about a guy like LeBron James, who I absolutely adore, who was on Sports Illustrated by the time he was 18 years old and ended up exceeding all expectations. And then you have, you know, other players like, you know, a, a name that they compare Jason Dominguez to a lot is a Zion Williamson. And Zion Williamson came into the league as the number one overall pick, had a rough first couple of years, and now he's finally starting to hit his stride. But this is a guy that I'm just super pumped about. Again, we're calling him the Martian. That is legitimately a nickname because this dude is an absolute freak of nature. Dude, his like slash line in high A last year is absolutely insane. He slashed 306, 397, 510 with a 145 WRC plus. The guy walked 12% of the time. He walked 12% of the time. Like that is this is these are elite numbers that we're looking at here. He's he's a five-tool player. He's got speed. He plays great defense. He does everything all across the board and everything that we love. So for a guy like that, I would like him to pan out like the LeBron James comparison that I just had, <laughs> as far as like an overhyped, you know, young prospect like yeah. that. Um, as you know, rather than you know, an Anthony Bennett who absolutely fell off after the NBA draft. I love these NBA comparisons. Yeah, you're out. rolling I'm the NBA cops right now. No, I'm going right now, dude. <laughs> but yeah, man, I think that eventually once he is able to come up, um, you know, and I think they will be able to give him ample time with the tools, you know, and the different kind of players that we have in the system right now. He's going to have all the time in the world. It's going to be in the next two to three years. Um, but when he's ready, he's going to come up and he's still going to be a stud. Oh, absolutely, dude. And that's the thing. Everyone likes to look at Jocelyn Dominguez. And simply based on his name and ranking in the system and the farm, you look at any baseball prospect list, he's always top four for the Yankees. Although recently, Baseball Prospectus recently released theirs. And Spencer Jones was listed ahead of him at three and Dominguez was four. While I may not agree with that entirely, first of all, can we talk about that potential? How in a couple of years now, our outfield will probably range left to right. Jones in left, Jason in center, and Judge in right. The triple J, baby. Like, I just think that the talent is all there for Dominguez, and you, you hit it right on the head with talking about his walk rate and strikeout splits. Um, for me, my favorite thing to look at and my favorite tool to judge prospects on is their eye and their approach at the plate. Do they swing at bad pitches? Do they wait for their pitches to hit? And do they work counts? Dominguez works counts like very few others. Again, he's 5'10", 5'11", stocky. When we first signed him, the dude looked like a mini Glaber Torres. Mm -hmm. I was like, there's no way in hell this kid's 16. And now he's kind of filled out his frame a bit more over the past couple of years. 
But yeah, he walked 12 and a half percent time last year, only struck out 18 and a half percent of the time with Hudson Valley. And then in the five games that he saw at double A, because he, as you remember, was promoted for that last late season push for the Somerset Patriots, he walked 13.6 percent of the time. Sure, he didn't do anything really with the bat because he only bat 105 and didn't really get anything going. But it was five game sample size. So I'm not looking at all the results put in play. I'm looking at the process. And Jocelyn Dominguez's process has never been one to doubt. The guy just goes up there, has incredibly quick hands, excellent lower body torque, uses his hips, uses his legs to get a lot of oomph into the baseball. And I truly believe that, look, I don't want to trade Dominguez for anyone. If Brian Reynolds requires Jocelyn Dominguez, I hang up the phone because this guy could be Brian Reynolds in two years. He could, I think his floor is like a Benintendi, Brian Reynolds level of production player. And then his ceiling is, as we've talked about and alluded to, some of the best players to ever touch a baseball bat in the glove in the entire history of the game. Like, I think Dominguez is one of those guys that deserves to, one, be given time to progress. Like, I think next year he's going to spend probably 80% of the season in double A until maybe a late season call up to triple A, a la Anthony Volpe. But I also think that the Yankees should not be so, um, I'm trying to think of the word, not so hesitant with him. Where it's like, we've seen in the past, the Yankees have kind of held on to prospects and let them play in the minor leagues a bit too long. Although there have been also other cases where they don't. I think Dominguez has to fall in that second category. If Dominguez is batting like 350 in July with double-A Somerset, he should be in triple-A. Like, I, I don't want to hear this, oh, he's only 19, he's only 20, he needs time. When you have these types of players with this type of talent and God-given abilities, you have to give them every shot in the world to progress, right? Or am I crazy saying Dominguez should be in triple-A next season? No, he should absolutely, you know, and the thing is, like, last year you hit the nail on the head, man. He played five games in double-A. I'm not going to judge him off that sample size. I'm going to look at what he did. People do this, sadly. <laughs> yeah, which is, like, unreal. Like, you, he played five goddamn games. Like, what do you expect out of the kid? But, like, you know, I don't – I'm going to look at the 40 games that he played in high A and how much of a stud he was out there. You know, and the thing with the Yankees is you kind of hit the nail right on the head. It's the service time manipulation thing. We're, we saw the same thing last year with Oswald Peraza and even Oswald Cabrera when he ended up coming up. Oswald Cabrera was not a player that, like, we were looking at. It's like, oh, yeah, this is going to be a guy that's going to come up and help us make a late season push. He did. Look at him now. Look at where he is for this team. He could be our starting left fielder for, you know, the near future at this point with Cabrera. But, like, it's the service time manipulation thing. Right now, we're looking at the same kind of situation with Anthony Volpe. When is he going to come up? When is he going to be able to do it? Because they're looking at arbitration. It's how the Yankees work. They are not like, you know, uh, the Houston Astros when they gave Jeremy Pena that that opportunity last year directly after Carlos Correa left. That's something that we as Yankees fans want the organization to do. That is 1,000% something that yeah. they need to do in this upcoming season with Oswald Peraza and Anthony Volpe and, you know, even Jason Dominguez in the next couple of years. And – a really like exciting prospect that I like to look at is how does he fit in this outfield? I love the fact that you brought up Spencer Jones, who I absolutely love. But Ooh. we're talking about you have you can mix in, mix and match a combination over the next couple of years. You you know you still have Harrison Bader, who I'm assuming they probably will extend. He's going to be a free agent after this season. You're going to have to extend that guy. They have Oswald Cabrera, who at this point most likely is going to play left field for this team. Obviously, they have Aaron Judge. They're still going to have John Carlos Stanton. Spencer Jones will be up at some point, and Jason Dominguez. So it's an interesting dynamic of, oh, and I forgot our good friend Aaron Hicks will still be on the roster, you know, bar his contract doesn't get done. So, so, you know, there's that, like, six combination. I'm going to go with five because I hope he's off the roster at some point. But it's going to be interesting to see in the next couple of years, man, how it mixes and matches. I love the three J's thing that you did. I think that's, like, the hottest thing ever. But, you know, it's it's going to be interesting to see how they were able to mix and match with those five. I, I hope it's I hope it's five guys, not six. Um, with five guys, uh, you know, if they decide to extend Bader, if they decide to put Cabrera in that utility role more. So this just – it's super exciting to see the you know the potential, the prospect of the potential of this kind of guy coming up and making a real impact at the major league level, major league level because he really will once he hits the bigs. Exactly, man. And like the Yankees are so loaded in terms of positional player position player talent in the farm system. Like everyone's been talking about with the Reynolds deal and all the mocks that have been going around, how the Pirates want pitching. The Yankees really don't have a really deep farm when it comes to pitching. Like our two top arms or our three top arms are probably going to be. Will Warren, Yoendris Gomez, and then Clayton Beater, who we just recently got for Gallo in a dump, which is crazy to think as well. Like, GG's Cashman, got to give you credit for that one, my guy. Clayton Beater's a stud. Ryan Garcia did a phenomenal article on him a little bit ago. If you guys want to go check that out, 
just search Clayton Beater. It'll be one of the first ones because that's how ESM roll, baby. We got the SEO on Google on lock. Um, but no, that, that, that you alluded to, there's so much talent in this minor league system that's going to just kind of come up in the next couple of years. And it also allows the Yankees to potentially move some of those guys. Like you didn't even mention Everson Pereira or right, Elijah yeah. Dunham or some of the other guys that we have in the system that are just kind of outfield sneaky guys that could potentially make a make a move for themselves and take a spot on this 40 man and 26 man down the road. But the idea of a Judge Jones, Jocelyn outfield just sounds so good because of the way they all approach the plate and because of how they play defense as well. Spencer Jones, you said you're a huge fan of his. He's a he's a beast. I mean, the guy came out of one of the most prestigious, if not the most prestigious baseball college in America in Vanderbilt. And he's basically a mini judge. That's why he gets so much attention because of his size. But you watch how he plays and it's different than judge. He's much more patient. He's looking for line drives and opposite field singles. And Jocelyn Dominguez is kind of the same way. The one, most interesting thing I think with, uh, think with Dominguez is that if you look at his numbers in the five games he played at double A, he had a higher line drive percentage than he ever had, lower ground ball percentage than he ever had, roughly the same fly ball percentage as he ever had, and the highest fly ball, uh, home run to fly ball percentage that he ever had in his career. Again, five game sample size, so we shouldn't look too much into it, but he got up there and he was still barreling up the baseball, still torching it, hit two home runs, walked twice, and drove in six in Somerset's championship game in which they were up 10 to nothing in the first inning. Like, the talent is very clearly there with the Martian. The only thing I worry about is, is it too much on his shoulders already? Like I asked at the beginning of the episode. Like, is there something to be said about people saying, hey, you are going to be like, like you said, that LeBron James of baseball, essentially, where you're going to be featured at 17, 18 years old and covered. And then we're going to figure, the difference between he and LeBron is that LeBron was immediately a star. Jocelyn, when he was covered, like as the, the Martian, he, everyone knew he's got probably four or five years in the minors before he makes that leap. But if he makes the leap at 21, which would be a year and a half from now, that that's insane. The average MLB age to come up through the minor leagues now is what, 25, 26? Yeah, it's 25 still. probably, yeah. And if, he's, if he beats that by four years, the last time we saw someone do stuff like that was like the Corey Sagers, the Francisco Lindors, the Carlos Correas. Like these guys are all bona fide superstars at this point. And if Dominguez can even fall into – like a category below that, that's still a four war outfielder for the next mm. four or five years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the one comparison that I like to pull up with him now, and like I, I don't know why this just like mind blank me, but it's like Bryce Harper. Cause like Bryce Harper was legitimately everywhere when he came up, he was on the covers of everything and he came up and, you know, obviously became a bona fide star, but I think it's different with Dominguez just because he's coming up through the system and comparing him to a guy like Bryce Harper Harper came up through the Nationals, who obviously don't have the pedigree like a Yankees team no. does. Um, you know, no offense to <laughs> Nationals fans and that organization, but it's it's just how it is. Um, Twenty two Nationals fans but, remaining. Right, yeah, but at this point, man, like he's going to be able to come up and he's going to be able to play with an Aaron Judge. He's going to be able to come up and play with a John Carlos Stanton, and just guys like that are going to be around him. There isn't going to be this immense pressure on him for for him to you know essentially perform immediately. And it's the same kind of conversation that we have about Anthony Volpe. There are a ton of guys that are going to be around them to be able to guide them and lead them into this you know, usher them essentially into the, the next stage of their career. And that's why I'm so happy that they ended up naming Judge the captain because now he has that role right in front of him and he can end up leading these young guys and lead us, you know, hopefully to a World Series championship, which would be great. But I just don't think that the there isn't going to be this overwhelmingly immense pressure on Dominguez, you know, coming through the ranks and being, being able to come up in the big leagues and having to perform immediately. Um, so, yeah, I'm pumped. Dude, he's he's the lead up hitter <laughs> of the future. He's absolutely no, no, the absolutely, guy. yeah. No, like absolutely. everyone's looking at these outfield options on the market and talking about potentially doing a sign for a couple year deal or trading for someone and then extending them. Like that's been the big thing with Reynolds because I believe the Pirates offered him what was it six for seventy five million? It's been intense. And he's like, and he's like, go to hell. Like, that what are you talking about, money, yeah. dude? In what world would Brian Reynolds ever accept like a fifteen million AAV? Like this guy is one of the better center fielders in baseball, not defensively, but overall. And he is your star player, franchise player. And you're offering him Ben and money, less than Ben and got. Because then yeah. Benny, Benny got five for 75. You got five seventy-five. So yeah. for whatever reason, the Pirates are like, eh, we're just going to offer this. They think that they're the Braves, but they don't have Antonopoulos Island like the Braves do. Um, they just have nothing. They've got Cabrian Hayes and O'Neill Cruz as their, yeah, stay around, Brian. Stick around. See how it works. But you, you were 100% right as well with the Yankees' development. 
people like to kind of give Yankee, give the Yankees shit for the way they handle prospects a lot of the time. But you cannot doubt that when they get them right, they get them right. I mean, this is the team that drafted Aaron Judge in, I believe, the 25th round. And yeah. now he is the captain of the team, the first captain since uh, Jeter, and just won the AL MVP and could potentially win another one or two in the next couple of years. So it's like the Yankees know how to handle their superstar talent. And I think Jocelyn Dominguez falls right in that superstar talent bucket. And like you said, it could be a couple years from now, could be a year from now. But when it is, and he when he does get that call, it's going to be like, it's going to break the goddamn universe. Because when he comes up, it's going to be the Martian has arrived and he's finally made landfall. And this is what we've been waiting for. And even if he doesn't pan out as that 900, 920 OPS outfielder, like a lot of people have projected him to become, an 800 OPS center fielder with his speed, his range, his arm, his glove, his switch-handed bat. Like, I hate to make this comp because we all hate Aaron Hicks. But Aaron Hicks, for a couple of years there, from 2017 to 2020, was a damn solid center fielder worth 3, 4, F4 each season. And if we can get Jocelyn Dominguez to kind of be like that, like a mid-20s home run, 15, 20 steel guy with his defense and his abilities at the plate to spit on bad pitches. That'll be all I need. I don't need Dominguez to be a superstar. I just think he's going to be a superstar, which is why I don't want to include him in any of these deals. And I love that you said that he's probably not going to have all that much pressure because I didn't really think entirely about the guys that he's going to have around him. Mm -hmm. Like he's going to have so much MLB veteran experience, bona fide stardom around him that they're going to be like, dude, just do you swing the bat, play the game you love. At the end of the day, we're playing a, a children's game and just do what you can do to the best of your abilities. Like, I, I hate to say this quote because Zach Wilson sucks, but Zach Wilson came out a couple weeks ago and said, I'm just going out there trying to have fun. And he, that, that's, that's all it is. That's all it should be for these athletes. Like, I yeah. know it's their job and I know they're getting paid millions of dollars to go out there and play, but it's a sport. Sports at the end of the day, as much of a entertainment and business industry as they are, they're games. So if Jocelyn Dominguez can just keep that same mentality where it's like, hey, I'm just going to go do me and see what happens. I think the, the in the words of Michael Jordan, the ceiling is the roof. <laughs> like, I think he is incredibly talented, five-tool player, like you said. One of the truest five-tool players we've seen in a while come to the Yankees. Um, like, I know a lot of people may say Volpe's a five-tool player as well. But I just think Dominguez's his ceiling is higher than Volpe's. Would you agree with that mm -hmm. to kind of round off this episode? Where would you rank no, Dominguez in your prospect? For me, he's number one. Where would you be? Uh, I have him at two. I have him right behind Volpe. Um, I think that makes the most sense. And obviously, That's you know, right. he could end up climbing that ladder and we'll see Volpe get called up. And he will be number one eventually. There's no doubt about that. He's that he's going to reach that potential. But just Volpe just being in AAA, you know, in us being able to see more of him. Um, but crazy enough, man, I actually like in, I like that Aaron Hicks comp because I was looking at Aaron Hicks like 2018. Like Aaron Hicks is a five F four player in 2018, he was good. man. And it like, sucks he was because a, he's been so bad the last two years yeah, that everyone forgets this. You know, and me and Ryan were talking about it yesterday, man. Like this, the seven years, uh, seventy million dollar extension that he got in 2018 after a five F four, you know, one twenty five WRC plus season with twenty eight home steal. runs. That is good, man. Like I'm looking back on that, like. I cannot fault that on no. anybody because it's like, dude, you look at a player like that, you're not projecting this guy to absolutely fall off a goddamn cliff. No. And, like, if you're going to get that kind of production – and, you know, the years was weird. I think the seven years the was seven was a bit odd because I think you know, it was, like, for, 29 at the time. Yeah, or for a guy at that age, I'm like – And he was know, injured a bit. Set. Like, the years right, didn't yeah. make sense. But the AAV, no, dude. But the AAV was sick. Like, I will take that kind of player on $10 million – any day of the week. That's like right now, that's like getting an upgraded Brian Reynolds for $10 million a year, which is just not going to happen because Brian Reynolds right now is a three F four guy. Aaron Hicks was a five F four guy that season, which is crazy, man. I so I like, don't know that, how he did it. Like, yeah, he had to have been cheating. I know. <laughs> I know, dude. And now he just completely fell off a cliff. But if you're going to get that kind of production out of Jason Dominguez on a year in year out basis, you will take that every single time. I don't care if he's, you know, doesn't turn into this absolute superstar that everybody Everybody expects him to if he could put up those kind of numbers in a single season we're taking we're gonna take a four f4 season from a guy every single time man because he's you know that's like that's a that's a perfectly ideal scenario and it feels weird for me to compare you know this highly touted otherworldly prospect jason dominguez to one of the worst outfielders at this point that i've ever seen in 2022 aaron hicks 
But, you know, I'm comparing him to 2018 Aaron Hicks and that kind of production. That that's would be that's when Hicks said he could have that 30-30 before this season. Remember that? The well, worst that's quote he that could, I've ever seen He could have had the 30-30 in, in 2018. If he, had got, if he had stayed healthy, quote. he was, like, kind of pushing it. Yeah, and that, yeah, that's man. one of the worst quotes. He was only like, 23 home runs off last year. I know. So. Well, <laughs> but, but, no, I agree with you. I hate comparing him to Hicks. But at the same time, you look at their build and you look at how they play – both guys are going to strike out low 20s, walk high teens, going to probably not bat 300, although I think Dominguez could bat 300, which yeah. is insane. But if he's a 270 hitter, he's still going to walk like 350, 360 OBP. And then let's say he posts a 440, 460 slugging. That's like an 800, 820 OPS outfielder with his speed and power comp as well. He's going to be a 120, 130 WRC plus player mm -hmm. with great defense. Like right. the future is so blindingly bright for Jason Dominguez that I just, I knew we had to do an episode talking about him. I mean, the month of January and February for baseball are obviously the slowest, groggiest, most grueling months of the year. But it also allows you to kind of dive deeper into the farm, look at the prospects, kind of look at who is going to make a jump next season, who will get those spring training invites and try to fight for a roster spot. The last thing I'll ask you to kind of round off this episode is do you think Jocelyn Dominguez gets invited to spring training? Yes, I think so. I think like, at, at this point he was in double A, so I would assume so. I think yeah, he and Dunham got to get those calls, baby. Yeah, I, I think they're going to be very open with, you know, bringing in the young guys this year. And, you know, you even heard Cashman say to Volpe that he has a shot to be the starting shortstop this year. So it would not surprise me whatsoever if Jason Dominguez got invited. Yeah, no question. No question. Oh, I can't wait, dude. I can't wait. We only have a yeah. month and a half. We only have like basically a month and a week or so until yeah. pitchers and catchers report, which is insane. I mean, although a lot of other teams haven't released one, they're like having everyone come in. The Tampa Bay Rays have, and they did so on August 31st. They're like, yeah, you guys are showing up the that's week like of nuts. Valentine's Day, yeah, which is crazy. Funny. But it's like, okay, hey, if that's what the Rays are doing, I imagine other teams will kind of fall in that same line. So only like a, basically a month or so until we can start really getting back into Spring training is just around the corner. Pitchers and catchers are reporting. We're getting ready for baseball again. But in the meantime, we're going to spend the time talking about superstar prospects like Jason the Martian Dominguez, baby. So I hope everyone enjoyed this episode as much as Sam and I did. If you did, make sure to leave a like and comment below. Let us know if you think Jason Dominguez is going to be a superstar as well. Or maybe you think he'll be traded here in the coming weeks for Brian Reynolds. I sure hope not. But who knows? As always, with Fireside Yankees, I'm Nick. That's Sam. Peace. Later. Adios. Uh -huh.